For 20 years, the biggest question remained. Who was the Maiden Water victim? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Lena Reyes Geddes. Viewer discretion is advised. It was a calm afternoon on April 20th, 1998. Two passerbys were just simply driving down a Utah highway, Highway 276, and they were passing by an area called Maiden Water Spring. As they were passing by this area, they saw this big kind of just clump uh, just right there in the middle of the dirt. And because curiosity got the better of them, they began to approach this object. This object appeared to be the just wrapped in these big black bags, trash bags. And when the people opened it up, they were shocked to find what they found. It was a human body. So they immediately alert police. When police arrive, they confirm that there is a human body inside this, and it had been wrapped in several plastic bags, which those bags were wrapping up this like large children's uh, rug, like a, one of those like kid play rugs that has like a, a city thing on it so kids can like pretend they're playing on the city. And then the body itself was put into a sleeping bag. And all of this had been bound up together with duct tape. The woman's body had not been um, completely decomposed. As a matter of fact, her face was still very identifiable. They believe that she was somewhere between the ages of 37 and 45 years old. And she was Hispanic. Her cause of death was that she had a single gunshot wound through her head. And she herself had been bound with uh, like ropes. There were several ropes not only um, tied with her, but also tied around the whole contraption that she was wrapped up inside. And most alarmingly of all, her fingertips, all of them, had been cut off at an angle. And that way there were, so that way there was no fingerprints to be able to identify her. No identity was also found in there. So no driver's license or anything like that. There was nothing present that would help them identify her. So she quickly became just known as the Maiden Water victim and there, there was nothing to go on. They tried to release her image, like her autopsy image, to see if anyone in the in the area recognized her. They came up with a couple different composite drawings of her. They tried to circulate those around the area, but this was right kind of at the beginning of, or not really totally in existence yet, the. Uh, the internet. It really hadn't been used by every single person in the country or the world at that point yet. And so getting these images out there was not as easy as it is today. And so because no one came forward to identify her, she her case just went cold. And there was over the years they would investigate her case and there was a suspect they had. There was a guy named Scott Lee Kimball who was really their only suspect for some time. And the reason why is, is this, it fit his MO. So he had been responsible for at least four murders, confirmed. Some people refer to him as Scott Hannibal Kimball. And the way the body was disposed of was extremely similar to the way he disposed of other bodies. And when they interviewed someone that had been close to Scott Kimball, they said that, this person said that, the rug that the Maiden Water victim was found in was something similar that she saw Scott Kimball purchase. Scott Kimball was confirmed to be in Utah in 1998. He was visiting family at that time, the time the body would have been discovered. The body was not decomposed yet, so she had only been there for a short time. Scott Kimball also claimed to have murdered a hitchhiker in the Utah area around that time frame. But as the years go by, while Scott Kimball is still a suspect, as years go by, the technology continues to advance and they're able to take the ropes and the, tw the twine that had been wrapped around the body, that had been wrapped around the bags and all of that, they had been able to swab all of those to see if they can get some kind of DNA from it, and they do. Um, and so they are able to collect several DNA samples from various pieces of evidence. Not a single piece of that DNA evidence, they tried to match it up with Scott Kimball. It was not a match. So the DNA found with the body did not match Scott, Kim Scott Kimball, and so they ruled him out as the suspect. 
but they still had no idea who the woman was. And the case kind of again went to the back burner again because they had no leads or tips or anything. They didn't know who she was, they didn't know who killed her, they didn't know how she got to where she got. It was all just a mystery. Fast forward now to 2018, uh, a Utah cold case team is now working on this case. And so they decide to take the autopsy photo of the woman's corpse and they placed it on the internet. Just by sheer uh, amazing coincidence, like uh, it's insane how this worked out. The exact same week they released the photo in Utah of her autopsy photo in Youngstown, Ohio, police had updated a photo of a missing woman who had gone missing decades prior. Both photos were released within the same week, one in Utah, one in Ohio. This is a pretty, you know, good distance apart. And an internet armchair detective sleuth uh, was combing through websites like Name Us and stuff like that. And they noticed that there, and she, that this woman lived in California and she had seen a photo of the autopsy photo from Utah and also saw a photo of the woman in Ohio. And she thought, wow, those two look very, very similar. She then looked into the description of the missing woman from Ohio and it really matched most of the, the description of the deceased woman, the Jane Doe in Utah. Most importantly, the biggest factor was that the missing woman had a mole in one of her ears and the autopsy photo the woman also had a mole in her ear a very unique characteristic so the woman reaches out to authorities both in ohio and utah and says hey you need to see if these are the same person well the missing woman was a woman named lena reyes gettys and they discovered that lena now had some family in mexico and some family in texas they reach out to any family members they can. And one of Lena's sisters, who was 11 years old at the time of Lena's disappearance, she uh, agreed to provide a DNA sample to see if the DNA from, you know, her DNA would match the Jane Doe victim found in Utah. And the DNA matched that the DNA from this woman who was in Mexico, who was a sister to Lena Reyes Geddes, matched the DNA of their maiden water Jane Doe victim they now knew who she was. So now they're kind of rewinding time. They go back to 1998. Um, Lena Reyes Geddes was never reported missing officially by her own husband. Her husband's name was Edward Geddes. 37 year old Lena, uh, they had, she had met him about two years prior to her death they met in New Mexico. Lena had recently got a degree in international business. She was also an accomplished ballet dancer. Uh, she was originally from Mexico herself, but I don't really unfortunately have a lot of detailed information on Lena, but I do know that she had met Edward Geddes, they got married and then they moved to Toledo. And in 1998, Lena was supposed to be getting on a plane and flying down to Texas. And then she was going to be flying to Mexico. She was gonna be visiting family in in Texas and then visiting family in Mexico. However, she never got to Texas and she never got to Mexico. Her family keeps trying to find out where she is, but Edward is really not saying anything. And Edward himself never reports her missing. And so her family calls to the authorities in Youngstown, Ohio to say, hey, my sister, my family is, is I, we don't know where she is. And so at that point, a missing person's file is officially opened and they finally are able to reach out to Edward Geddes and say, listen, we need you to come in and give an, and give an interview, give a statement. And he tells police back in 1998 that he dropped her off at the airport in Pittsburgh, that they, uh, she had, was carrying her suitcase, a cosmetics case. She had a blue sleeping bag with her. And he says they kissed, they said goodbye to one another and that's it and he never saw her again. Why he never reported her missing or ever seemed to care that she was missing, it's it's not really known. Well, I mean, it's known now, but back then it was like, this is weird. But there really, there was no evidence, physical evidence that he had caused her any harm because th at that point, they didn't know she was even dead. And because they're, you know, because she was an adult, she was 37 years old, adults are allowed to just suddenly pick up and leave and go anywhere they want to. It's not illegal to go missing, to make yourself go missing necessarily. And because they had no evidence of a crime scene, they didn't have any signs of a struggle anywhere, they didn't have any signs of a murder had taken place, 
there really was nothing much they could do. And then finally in 2018, once Lena was identified as being the body found in 1998, they knew that she was dead within a day of her last being seen alive. So now at that point, they were able to take some evidence that they had collected from the body. So they all those DNA swabs they had from DNA found on the ropes and other pieces of evidence with the body. And they knew that the ropes were tied around Lena, meaning that the killer definitely was the one to tie those ropes. And again, they had already tested it against Scott Kimball, wasn't a match. So they wanted to know, okay, well, is this DNA, does it belong to Edward Geddes? Well, they find out that Edward Geddes in 2018 is now dead. Edward had committed suicide in Nevada back in 2002. Gee, I wonder why he did that. But they were able to, it took them some time, but they were able to track down family members of Edward Geddes. They were able to convince them to willingly supply their DNA um, so that they could try to link it to the DNA found at the crime scene, and they did so. So this is about four years after Lena is actually identified. So in 2022, with familial DNA found from Edward's family, they were able to confirm that the DNA found on those ropes that would have come from the person who killed her was in fact a match to Edward Getty's family. It wasn't you know, that direct match to that family member, but they were able to determine that it the DNA was from Edward. And so in 2022, they finally had all the answers. It took about 20 years to find out who she was and about 24 years to find out who did it. The reasons behind it really are, won't be known because he's dead. They will never really know why he killed her. They'll never really know what the history was between the two of them. All they know is that he did it. He killed his wife. Did he kill her in Ohio? Did he kill her in Utah? How did he get from Ohio to dump her body in Utah? Did he drive there with her body? Were they on some kind of road trip together where he killed her in Utah? You know, it's it's not even in her path. Like she was supposed to be going to Texas and then to Mexico. Utah wasn't even in the works. Like there was no reason for her to even be there. So the more likely scenario is that something happened in their home in Ohio where he probably he killed her, he shot her in the head. And then he wrapped her up in that rug. And then he wrapped her up in some trash bags, tied her up, bound her body with the rope. And then I'm guessing put her in his vehicle, drove her all the way to Utah where he dumped her. With her body being still not really in full decomposition, I mean, this would have had to have happened pretty quickly. He would have had to get her to Utah from Ohio almost immediately after killing her. But the circumstances of all of that is will never really be known because he's dead and they can't question him on it. There's no other witnesses who have come forward to say, you know, I know this or I know that. But the most important part is they know who she was and they know who killed her. The whys and the hows and all of that would have been something that would have come up at trial, but there won't be a trial. There won't be a conviction because Edward Geddes took the coward's way out and killed himself. Never, never having to face justice for what he did to Lena. Lena's family um, in Mexico, uh, including her sister that provided the DNA to get that match to Lena, um, they now have her remains and they brought them back to Mexico where they buried her and they gave her a proper burial and they were able to lay her to rest. You know, they they do have the benefit of being able to know where she finally you know was all that time and they're able to lay her to rest, but there's always going to be those questions, those lingering questions as to why. Um, why did this have to happen? When did it happen? What led to it happening? Those answers died with Edward. I mean, there might be people out there who know exactly what happened. You could always come forward to say, but, you know, th this is one of those stories where will that really even matter anymore since he's dead? Will it matter? knowing that knowing that information will it change anything and this is a this is one of those stories too where you do you have to and like i'll never i don't know this as a person who never has had a victim like this in my family thank goodness so i'll never really know but i i think that's really more of a question for people who do have in their lives victims of murder 
homicide, missing persons. Is there really such a thing as closure? Um, is that really a thing? And I've seen I've seen different answers from different people. And I think it just varies case by case, person by person. Some people have said that, no, there is no such thing as closure. Some people have said, yeah, I mean, they do feel that sense of everything kind of coming to an end and closing that chapter once the, the answers are given. And so I, I personally can't answer that question, but there are people who can, but the answers are gonna be different based on who you ask. Why did Lena have to die? What did he get from it? Anything? Was it a spur of the moment, just heat of the heat of the moment, passion kind of thing? Was it premeditated? And unfortunately, you know, while Lena did finally get to get a proper burial, unfortunately, Lena Reyes will never get the justice that she truly rightfully deserved. But that is it for this case, True Crime, Aruni, Dooney, Dingleberry Dongs. I hope you found it interesting. Um, as usual, if you are new here, hello, my name is Mike. I tell true crime stories here on YouTube. Uh, so please subscribe if you're into that kind of thing. I also tell true crime stories over on TikTok. Uh, you'll find that in the link tree in the description of this video below. Also in the description below, you'll find my email address. Um, if you want to recommend a case to me, uh, just send me the name of the individual, where it happened, when it happened. I'll add it to my list. The list is over or close to 6,400 names long at this point. I pick the cases I cover each time at random, so I can't promise you when I'll cover your case, but I will get to it eventually. You can also see the list. It is public. That list is in that link tree below. Um, you can scroll through it. For the most part, it's alphabetical. So you know, you can always type and search for a name. And if it shows up, you don't have to email me. If you don't see it, then email me. So, but that is it for this video. So we will see you for the next case. And until then, ta-ta for now. True crime. Arunish. Aha. Whoa, that was weird. Nope.